Welcome and welcome back for those of you who attended our first program in this series. This virtual public program is presented in conjunction with Yoshitomo Nara, an exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, curated by Nika Yoshitaki. The exhibition spans over 30 years of the internationally acclaimed artist practice from 1987 to 2020 um, through the lens of his longtime passion for music. My name is Chela Montoya and I'm the Assistant Vice President of Adult Education and Public Programs at LACMA. I am very excited to introduce the art and conversation, Yoshitomo Nara, the second program in a series that will th take you through three different periods in Nara's career. This session is entitled Nara, Kawaii and the Super Flat Concept, which is a postmodern mov movement founded by the artist Takashi Murakami. It is presented by Iwan Kuhn, Chair of the Department of Art History at the University of Hong Kong and author of Yoshi Tomonara, a recently published monograph on the artist. Although we are still unable to be in the exhibition due to the stay at home orders, uh, we wanted to share um, this series and the recently released books and catalogs uh, in the meantime and I do have my copies here. I wanted to give a brief show and tell. Uh, once again, before we begin, I'm gonna give you a close up looking at this um, beautiful catalog. So this is the uh, exhibition catalog, which will give you a sneak peek of the works on view featured in the exhibition. It has liner notes written by the artist about various albums in his personal collection. So this is a beautiful catalog. Uh, here is the limited edition catalog, which includes a clamshell case, and it also has a beautiful bright yellow LP um, with original music and covers by the indie rock band Yolo Tengo and songs from 19, the 1960s and 70s selected by the artists. It also has a beautiful suite of booklets inside um, that gives a full range of Nara's work. And finally, Iwan's recent book, which is a 30, 300 plus page monograph on the artist that looks at his work from the past three decades. So it's a beautiful um, uh, collection of um, information about the artist's trajectory. So please um, enjoy these resources in the meantime, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the museum when we're able to. Now throughout the program, I wanna encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A function. We hope to get to as many as we can by the end of the presentation. And just for fun, please do share where you're coming from in the world. I am based uh, here in Los Angeles. And of course, um, Iwan is presenting from Hong Kong. Um, and now I would like to formally introduce you to Iwan Kuhn and share her extensive background. So let me just go ahead and read her bio. Uh, Professor Iwan Kuhn is the chair of the Department of Art History at the University of Hong Kong. Her research expands a broad area of Qing art and a secondary area in contemporary art in Asia. Her publications include Yoshitomo Nara 2020, which is recently, uh, which is currently being translated to other languages. A Chinese Canton painting the local and export art 2018 and a defiant brush, Sue Renshan and the politics of painting in 19th century Guangdong 2014. She is the recipient of several research awards, including a Fulbright Senior Fellowship, American Council of Learned Scholars, and visiting scholarships at Cambridge University and Columbia University. Kuhn is also works in contemporary, the contemporary art field as a critic and curator. In 2014, she was the guest curator of It Begins with Metamorphosis, Shu Bing at the Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and was one of the selected curators for the 12th Guangzhou Biennial Imagine Borders in 2018. She is currently working on an international exhibition of Hong Kong art scheduled for June alongside the inaugural Halinsky Biennale. So please welcome and give a warm virtual welcome to Professor Yuan Kun. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Cello. Uh, I would like to say thank you to um, everyone who had helped me with putting this uh, presentation together. Uh, and I also want to thank the LACMA team for doing such a fabulous job with this as well. This is the, as um, Cello mentioned, this is the second of three series that I will be doing. And in this particular series, let me just uh, share my screen with you. Um, so let me start again. Uh, hello, welcome to this second um, talk of this series. Last week, I spoke about the beginnings of Nara's paintings of these big headed girls, uh, some of the influences, and in particular, what happens when we start framing his paintings in a narrative about survival and empathy, but asking the question, what does she want from us as opposed to who she is? Now, in this session, I concentrate on the next period, which is the period of 2000 to 2011, a period when Nara becomes very big on the international stage and when viewers and writers, in order to understand the meaning of his work, often use the term superflat, a concept which was created um, and proposed by Takashi Murakami, but now has entered much more mainstream use that it uh, becomes very much associated with any kind of artists who start appropriating images and products from Japanese subcultures, especially manga and anime, as part of that identity. So in other words, the term has now become such a shorthand token, it is perhaps time to revisit what the meaning of super flat is, how it came about, and ask whether Nara really is a super flat artist. Now, if I am arguing that to look at Nara through the lens of Superflat and its association with the visual world of manga limits our understanding of his art making, what well, then are the alternatives? And that's what this talk will be really focused on. In the next 35 minutes or so, I would take us on a journey that begins with a more contextual history of Japanese art, moving on to, on to uh, a greater understanding of Nara's own journey during this period of 2001 to 2011. But let me begin first with dissecting what is meant by Superflat. Um, created by Murakami Takashi, it was also uh, a way uh, of describing a type of artwork that became really big on the international stage, uh, stage. And Murakami and Nara are both good friends. They came, they came up around the same time. And they first met as visiting teachers at UCLA in 1998. In 2000, Murakami presented his Super Flat Manifesto, which came together with an exhibition in which Nara was one of the artists. Now, while this was not Nara's first American exhibition, his first solo show was actually at the Institute of Visual Arts at the University of Wisconsin. It was one that is more than any others, I think, really caught people's imagination. So what was it about this particular show? And I think a lot of that had to do with this particular theory, uh, which is a very ambitious one, in that it provided an explanation of how to look at certain types of contemporary Japanese art, providing insights into uh, not only Japanese culture, but also a history that explained why it looked the way it does. It was a very complete idea that was being presented. And more importantly, I think it was making a claim for an identity of Japan that was not reliant on using the West as a comparative and often implicitly superior other. And in so doing, what Murakami was engaging with was those big intellectual questions that were being asked in the 1980s and the 1990s, that were discussions on political identities and the role of the non-Western in a new age of globalization. Just to give that a bit more context, uh, in 1998, so two years before uh, the Super Flat show, Asia Society in New York had held a major contemporary Chinese art show called Inside Out that also challenged a Eurocentric way of understanding Asia. I should perhaps point out here that although I'm using the, that the term non-Western, which I'm using here, is understandably problematic because it maintains this, this sort of forced binary relationship, it was one that was readily used at that moment in time. And what we really see is Murakami's super flat idea right in the thick of this landscape. Not only was what Murakami presenting very relevant at, to that moment in time, that intellectual world, he, what he did was something even smarter, I think, in that he not only presented a manifesto, he also, along with it, presented examples of what Superflat looked like as evidence that Superflat existed. In all, there were three exhibitions. 
um, each one traveling to different parts of America primarily, uh, although the second one was started in Paris. And collectively, what they did was promote this cultural explanation of Japan that lasted if you can, uh, from 2000 to 2005. And thereafter, what we see are other similar shows, this idea again picked up by other exhibitions, um, so that it carried on for almost the entire of that decade. So for almost 10 years, we had this idea of super flat that not only circulated, um, but became deeply ingrained. So much so that the word super flat which are two separate words, are now often written as also one single word. In these shows, what Murakami did was he also brought together artists, designers, and manga artists, all presenting this other subcultural world of Japan. Now, Superflat is a very complex idea. It is an idea that combines history, social science, art history, and art making itself. And what he's essentially doing, he's offering um, flatness or super flatness as a stylistic language. So at the visual level, it's an aesthetic that embraces surfaces rather than depth, the spectacle, um, for example, rather than the cerebral. And as a conceptual idea also where flatness offered an alternative to hierarchical structures of power, where low culture was as important as high culture. And that's a very important part of his super flat idea. And so as a result of this, the West is not used as the gauge of modernity and thus not the center of a postmodern world, which is fragmented and pluralistic. Now, in order to prove this, this idea of super flat, he makes three interrelated claims. And each one of these is tied to three different periods of Japanese history. There was the idea of the remote past by which really it was um, the long 18th Edo period that stretches into the early 19th century. The second period is the wartime Japan, and in particular, the devastation of the country by the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And then lastly, it was the contemporary world, the contemporary Japan, and in particular, the consumer culture of anime and manga, and the commodification of kawaii and also the otaku. Now, the conceptual linchpin that holds his idea of super flat together is the nuclear bombing of Japan. The Asia Pacific War of 1941 saw Japan engage in combat with American British forces in the Pacific, and which ended when the United States dropped two atomic bombs in 1945. One was called Fat Man in Nagasaki, and the other was Little Boy in Hiroshima. And which these and these particular acts, uh, these bombings changed the course of weaponized warfare. Of course, the after effects extended far beyond 1945. And this is this that Murakami picks up um, the narrative because he's proposing that the trauma of defeat had stunted the growth of the following generations in post-war Japan. Because of Japan's denial of its own history of nuclear destruction, in Murakami's formulation, this um, sort of induced this psychic state that had kept it perpetually infantilized, producing a society where there was this continuous, almost incessant pursuit of a childlike culture that cannot be separated from that repressed memory of the atomic bomb. For Murakami, the linear his narrative of history is now halted in its tracks, leaving Japan in this very permanent suspended state of being beyond which nothing can exist. The importance of the 1945 bombings as the root of the super flat theory is evident in the title of Murakami's, the third or the last of Murakami's three exhibitions, Little Boy. The subsequent nuclear fallout, Murakami suggests, is what gave rise to the ap apocalyptic tales that we saw in anime and manga, such as Godzilla, Ultraman, Astro Boys, I'm just naming the, some of the most popular ones from the top of my head, that was very, very popular in the subsequent de um, decades where monsters, violence, um, sexuality, and youthful sweetness as well formed this sort of utopian dystopian future. Uh, here's the inside page of the catalog for Little Boy, uh, uh, the 2005 exhibition. Now, in particular, Murakami was drawing his theory based on the cultural world of otaku. So we've now moved from the 1945 to the contemporary world. A common definition often regards otaku as a type of person, 
a male who indulges in video games and comic books, and we're seeing a, a particular example here up on the screen, but it is perhaps more accurate to define otaku as a mode of social being. There are also scales of differences within this otaku world. Um, it generally um, describes those who indulge in deviant behaviors by reveling in that which is excessive and extreme, intensely obsessed with mass mediated fan merchandise and overly absorbed in this sort of world of virtual sociality. So rather than human social um, connections, it's about virtual social connections. They lived in the world of manga, the dystopic futures or the childish um, unrealities, um, which is often perpetually very sweet. The otaku's obsessive behavior gets played out in manga and anime and other visual related visual materials. Um, so you can see there's this very continuous, almost like circular movement of ideas that feed into one another, the reader, the fantasy, and this material world of books and objects that mediates between these two things. Um, part of the reason why all of this is so relevant to, uh, to Murakami's idea of Superflat is the, is the timing of it all. Um, Murakami is an artist who is very much in touch with cultural trends and collective identities as well. And underscoring his work is always this cultural relevance of a postmodern Japan. The golden age of manga also was in the late 1980s and 1990s. Um, just again, to give you some context to this is that in at its peak, which is in uh, 1995, there were 1.34 billion copies of individual manga books that were being published. It was a massive business. The domestic um, manga industry in 2016 was approximately three billion pounds um, sterling. But I want to step back a little bit to talk about what is manga. After all, we tend to use this term quite readily, but what is it? Although manga may have had its roots in early Japan and some scholars trace it as far back as 12th century, its earliest uh, appearance is often um, said to be a Hokusai uh, manga box, which I have an example, a page of it up here. Uh, However, Hokusai manga is not really the type of manga uh, that we, well, it's not really the type that we associate with today's manga books. Uh, instead, at that time, the word manga was used to describe a series of sketches that were then randomly published together as a set. Because what usually happened at this period in time is that uh, these particular sort of uh, prints, they were often sold in series. Uh, and they will be connected by some sort of theme. So it may be a set of 12, which meant then to do with the 12 months. Uh, or it may be a set of four, which case to do with the seasons, et cetera. But what you also had a set which were completely, they were somehow connected in terms, they may be all figures, but they were quite random in that they were not necessarily connected to one another. And as a result, these were class classified as a full sort of manga. So in these instances, it's not really used, the word manga is not really used to describe a genre, but it's really more a convenient placeholder to describe the random nature of a collection of images. It's not really until the second half of the 19th century, when manga begins to become associated with caricatures. And this is gonna be a very important development in where we have exaggerated images of facial expressions. Um, and we have this here in the middle image, which is off by uh, Kuniyoshi. Uh, and this was a very crucial step, um, partly just because this would then later become conflated with other types of of political and social satire. Uh, in particular, we had Japan Punch that was being introduced in the late Ameri um, century, and sorry, in the late 19th century in Japan as well, which published cartoons and comic strips um, that exploited this, this sort of caricature approach to image making. And what caricatures, caricatures did was they introduced the importance of very emotive expressions, such as close up of faces or extreme contortions of expressions as a kind of storytelling. And that is what is key. Because one of the fundamental differences between Japanese manga and say Europe uh, or American comics, especially in the early 20th century, um, if we think about something like Tintin or Tantan, is how is that relationship between text and image. In the Euro-American Euro tradition, 
text and image are much more closely related. If we think about how speech bubbles were often used in, as a way of driving forward a story. In Japanese manga, they relied less, less on text and they were relying much more on pictorial effect. Even sound are treated pictorially and have visual impact as they too get kind of caught up in that sort of pictorial energy of a page. So related to this sort of exaggerated emotive expressions that was brought about by uh, caricature is the importance of the line and, uh, and the line drawings that use very dramatic direction of pull and organization that would lead the viewer across the page. And again, I take a late 19th century example here, Yoshifushi's um, uh, triptych. And Yoshifushi is actually a student of Kuniyoshi's. Uh, and what we see here is how this drama will cross over the page, in this case, of three pages. So this idea of visual storytelling is what is one of the key things that I uh, that really begins in the late 19th century and I think feeds into later examples of manga and anime uh, artists. So Murakami takes this on uh, and Murakami is able to do so because he is actually, uh, he is a trained art historian with a PhD in Nihonga art, which is a 20th century modern Japanese painting. And he proposes that super flat by linking it back to this history in the Edo, late Edo period uh, and early Meiji is inherently a Japanese cultural phenomenon where, um, where the, these woodblock prints that favored this very flat aesthetic qualities be and belong to this consumerist world of Edo's pleasure quarters, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on, is what for him strengthens his argument of a specifically Japanese modernity. But what I find even more persuasive of what Murakami is trying to say is how he brings in a history of the social world of readers as an integral part of understanding visual language. In more plain English, it is really about the importance of the reception of art and how that was driving the making of art. So rather than thinking of it as this internalized world of the, of the artist, it's really also about the engagement with the people who are looking at the art. In other words, uh, he was thinking about visual culture and visual culture provided a very different mode of engaging with, uh, with art. And it again was something that was very much part of the landscape in the 1980s and 1990s when art historians and artists were thinking about different ways of toppling that hierarchy of art canons. Um, just to, again to give a bit more uh, context as well, in 1990 the National uh, Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo presented the first exhibition of a manga artist and this was Osamu Tezuka who was the creator of the much-loved Astro Boy uh, which he created in 1951. So we're beginning to see in the 1990s, this acceptance of the visual cultural world of manga and in particular, the importance of visual culture overall. Now, it wasn't just the, um, the Dragon Balls, the Astro Boys or the Silver Moons that were making an impact. These are the more, more famous uh, manga, uh, um, uh, manga comics that we had at this moment in time. It was also, the, the slightly offbeat ones that was also making an impact. And these ones, these, these more cult comics, let's call them, was finding its way in this larger world of international graphic novels. Uh, and in particular, we see these cult comic art finding an audience in the United States. By the late 1980s, graphic novels in the States had found a ready market of adult readers. It was becoming increasingly more popular. And it is possible to such possible to suggest that this introduction of manga had some impact in its development. Certainly among the likes of leading artists and writers such as um, Frank Miller, Art Spilgerman, who did Raw Magazine, they were also promoting through the introduction and translation of the more avant-garde style Japanese manga. And we see an example of this, which is Screw Style, uh, a graphic novel about a young boy uh, in war-torn Japan who merges out the sea and he's been bitten by a jellyfish and his artery is bleeding and he goes around Japan wandering around different uh, cities trying to find a doctor. And this particular book was trans eventually translated into English in 2003. All this to, is to say that there was a very strong Japanese American dialogue of anime and manga that was established already in the 1980s. 
So what Murakami was then doing was bringing these different strands of historical moments and international cultural dialogues into his world of superflat. So on the one hand, there's this continuation of history that's so important in understanding the idea of Japanese post-modern world. But also on the other hand, there was this idea of the conceptual fl flatness that breaks away conventional hierarchies. And I've already mentioned the importance of the larger social world of readers. But another important part of this is the visual culture is that visual culture is also about mass production, the consumption of things. And I'm here talking about in particular, a large scale consumption of kawaii products, such as the Hello Kitties or the Doraemon. And here we have an example of Doraemon in Hong Kong, which were all international household names. These were extremely popular. I mean, I remember growing up watching um, Doraemon cartoons uh, in England. Of all, um, so what we are seeing and what we're seeing with these with what Murakami is doing by drawing on this kawaii world as well is that he these now become a kind of cultural code of a hyper consumerist Japan and that will become part of his art now in many ways what he's proposing is not new in that by participating at that juncture of art and market he's really following in the footsteps of someone like Andy Warhol but his participation really taps again into that context of late 1990s Japan and with it he claimed free interrelated elements there was a massive level of consumption of kawaii goods which stretched across the world there was a blurring of art and commodity and there was the defining of a Japanese cultural identity. And all of this was to then become part of a crucial elements uh, that can collapse hierarchies through superflat, in that each of these three elements are played out as one thing. They can actually, by taking away these categories, the boundaries that define them what they are, all of these cultural motifs that he is using are all rendered the same. And so they have no inherent value. So if you were looking at his art and you're saying, well, this is Japanese, that doesn't quite work. It's not really quite just Japanese because it also has the blurring of arts and commodity. None of, uh, or if you were to think of it only in terms of commodity, you then also have to take in the cultural identity and this idea of kawaii, they all become one and the same. In other words, because they are all one and the same and there's no difference in which one is more important, he is suggesting that they have no inherent value. They are conceptually depth, depthless. They are super flat because they are one and all the same. Now, in many ways, super flat there is more of a conceit rather than a straightforward answer of course and effect. And although it is, it aims to flatten that hierarchy between high culture and, po and popular culture, to take just one example, it is precisely the tension that exists between the two that makes his works interesting. Let me just wrap up here um, with the super flat theory and move on to Nara, is that although super flat theory gained a lot of ground and was absorbed into mainstream use, there is a tendency to see only the Hello Kitties and the Godzillas or the Doraemon uh, as a kind of bizarre Japan rather than an attempt to see how the visual world of Japanese popular culture plays an important role in both forming a history and a way of navigating a past that is centered on the failure of war. Um, and so I think what Superflat can challenge us to do and continue to challenge us to do is to take seriously visual culture. Okay, what does this all have to do with Nara? As Afo mentioned, Nara is often pigeonholed as part and parcel of the world of Superflat. Uh, so in the rest of this talk, I'd be talking about how he does not actually fit in so readily into this category, even if there are superficially some overlaps of ideas. And so what I hope you would take away at the end of this talk is that there isn't a singular categorization of Chinese, um, sorry, of Japanese identity in contemporary Japanese art, even if we insist on cult using cultural identity as the primary mode of understanding Nara or indeed any other Japanese artist, we will fall short of appreciating the diversity of art making in Japan. Now, as you see, can see on the screen, what I have here is a definition of kawaii, and this is taken from a Japanese dictionary. And you can also see that there is a wide semantic range of its meaning from being sweet and lovely to pitiful and pathetic. And you can see how our 
how often I, we often translate kawaii as being cute is not just quite accurate or it doesn't cover this broad range. What is also important to note um, of, these of this translation, this, these definitions, is that it's not just about a description of what is cute, but rather, but also includes a mode of response. And I think this is very important. So in 1943, the Nobel Prize winning ethnologist Conrad Lorenz had proposed the idea that um, of what he calls baby schema uh, as a analytical model that he wants to identify certain traits of what is cute, um, a big head, a round face, large eyes, etc. To, to determine how cuteness can serve an evolutionary function and that it triggers a kind of protective behavior that increases the likelihood of offspring survival. More recent cultural studies have kind of pushed beyond this much more universalist theory to consider how cuteness can lead to more complex social behaviors, including companionship, co um, cooperative action, and overall a greater social, um, sorry, an agency of social survival. And these are these two things, both the Japanese definition of what is kawaii and these studies on, on cuteness that has been done in the West. If you bring all these together, I think this, this, they, they can explain much more what um, Nara is doing. Because while Nara has created an image that can be described as kawaii, as we see with this, this uh, painting, his 1991 painting, the girl with the knife in her hand, it is not a work about the consumption of things but rather about kawaii as a mode of human response. And this is a fundamental difference between Murakami's citations and uses of kawaii as a level of social critique of consumerism, even as he embraces it. Nara's approach to kawaii is much more personal. Like Murakami, Nara also draws on the Edo past in his work. And what we see here is a painting called The Longest Night, which is a reference to a theme which was made popular in the 18th century during the Edo period uh, by an artist called Suzuki Haranobu, which we see here. So on the surface, this will appear that Nara is delving into a history of Edo that embraced the importance of graphic arts and the importance of its flatness. And so there seem to be echoes of what, what Murakami is doing. However, if we look at the painting, we will see that although he's using lines, what really is quite striking about this work is how the painterly background resists that flatness of print and maintains that materiality of it as paint. But I also think there is something fundamentally different in how Nara engages with history. Hara Noble, who is one of the leading artists of Yukioe, this type of printed works that we see in here, was known for his colorful prints of willowy young beauties and mitate airs, which are parody images, which blended puns and allusions from classical literature with contemporary images of beauties, courtesans, and actors. And in order to create parodies, what he will need to do is create un unexpected juxtapositions of opposites, such as the literary and the profane, the austere and the flamboyant. So sometimes you will see, say, for example, a courtesan as a Buddhist figure. For those able to decode the works, such juxtapositions provided a sense of humor, a humorous response to the work itself. Here, Nara's citation of Harry Noble in many ways carries elements of this parody tradition as he turns the Edo motif of what should have been a traditional beauty into a defiant young girl. Here is another example in this series uh, in where he transforms even more so the Edo period UK or prints through graffiti and erasure. Um, he's literally, what he's done is he's turned Hokusai's a very famous great wave on its side. And then he's drawn on top of this, superimposed this giant menacing girl who's carrying a knife and with um, a male gender symbol on her arm, tattooed on her arm, slashing her way through a, Yuki a Yukioe world. Here is another example. Uh, and we consistently see this where he's using this very graffiti-like interventions, um, a very iconoclastic gesture. But it isn't in fact only very partial for he never truly destroys the origin, the prince, the image of the prince. It's not even an original prince. This is a, a, a more recent contemporary print uh, copy of the original. 
And what we really see here is a doubling effect of past and present. So in order to for him to impose that graffiti-like presence on this print, we must also still see the original image at the back. And it is that dialogue between the two that is important. And it is a dialogue that acknowledges history. Uh, this is a really great one where he adds uh, in this one in mirror, he adds his big headed girl as the reflection in Utamaro's famous print, uh, which is of a courtesan looking into the mirror and Otomaro, who was um, an incredible master of creating these very sexually charged works, captured very much the, um, the voyeuristic glances of beauties in Edo's floating world. And here, what Nara does is imposes this rather chubby looking face outlined in black in the mirror with her eyes closed. So she's not, he's not allowing us, the viewer, to look at her inner thoughts. He's deliberately cutting off that voyeuristic gaze, which is such a big part of Utamaro's work. So if we were to think about this in many ways that these his rebellious young girls in their interactions with this Edo world of prints um, shows women where in this Edda world, there are often, women are often scenes of objects of male desire. He's almost pushing back against a, a parallel contemporary history of manga and its male dominated otaku um, universe. I know I am stretching this with my feminist reading of these particular prints because they are not intended in any way to serve an activist role or claim a polit political position not least because each one of the sketches and prints in this particular series um, are doing the same thing. And in many ways, perhaps what they are closer to doing is they're showing Nara experimenting with different ways of engaging with these well-known historical images. Uh, they become, in other words, a kind of random play. So if this is manga, it is the manga of Hokusai, of random sketches, rather than a manga of the super flat world. Uh, this is Light My Fire, a work, a 2001 work, and one in many ways really embody that elements of kawaii. Again, if we are to look at the context in which these artworks are made, we may find yet another story behind it that pushes beyond reading this as a super flat work. Nara made this sculpture during his tenure as a guest artist at the Tokyo University of the Arts, where for a month he slowly carved this sculpture from a block of, uh, of wood in the company of students. And for him, this particular process took him back to his time as an art student. And it also resurrected as a result, a motif from those days as well, as seen in Romantic Catastrophe, a very early work made in 1988 when he was a student, uh, when, when he was a graduate student. So if Superflat provides a manifesto that is really about mapping cultural codes and identifying a collective um, identity, Nara arguably resists being part of that cultural mapping because what he's trying to do is express his own personal biography in his work. And I think one key way of seeing how his engagement with that social world of audiences is so different from that of others is how and how personal it is, is, is by looking at this particular show. In 2000, so this is the same time when Superflat was, was, uh, was shown, it's in the same year. Nara um, moves back to uh, Japan. And one reason he was doing that, or he's preparing for his solo show, I Don't Mind If You Forget Me, which opened in August 2001 at Yokohama Museum of Art. Now, one work in particular, I think, uh, captures more than any other in the show, something of what Nara was trying to achieve through a direct engagement with his audience. For this work, he asked volunteers to make dolls based, um, to make dolls by hand, based on designs that he shared through Happy Hour, which is a website set up by his fans, which were then sent to the museum. Some of these girls were then stuffed inside these, um, these acrylic containers that spelled out the, fra the phrase of the show, I don't mind, comma, if you forget me. In all, he had an overwhelming response of over 1,500 dolls, which was sent to the museum. 
And because there were so many, much more than they expected, they actually then went into another room against a mirror imprinted with the words, your childhood. Although this artwork um, is situated inside a white wall establishment of a museum, what Nara does is brings almost this grassroots intervention into this elitist space where amateur fans become producers of fine art. And it also speaks to a different kind of relationship between an artist and his audience. As fans, it was a way for him to think of gifting back to them, a social ritual that um, carries great significance and respect in Japan. As part of the exhibition, the museum also invited fans to write something down as a message which can be shared with visitors. And I just wanna read out very quickly one message. And this is from a person called Nano. First off, I was deeply impressed by how the exhibit, uh, exhibit was put together. Seeing so many brothers and sisters filled with love and care, I was so happy I could hardly stand it. No matter how many there were, and even though there were so many of them, I thought they were all works familiar to me in their innocence. I thought it was very wonderful that I could participate. When I found my child in the exhibition hall, I thought it really did arrive in good order, and I started to cry a little. Nano's message is evidence of that very strong relationship that people had with this project uh, and the strong emotions that it elicited as well. And it actually also reveals the not so uncommon tendency of Nara's fans to address each other as brother and sisters, which it then extends to the, the dolls as part of that network as children. And so we have this sort of odd fictive family ties that really challenge traditional concepts of the auteur and the aura of the original of the artworks. Um, and seen in this context, this installation then becomes not a singular product of one artist's practice, but a manifestation of a kinship network, a very populist gesture that in some ways challenges the commercialization of art. Now, the Yokohama exhibition was a pivotal moment in Nara's career, which grew very rapidly thereafter, both at home and abroad. And in that time that followed, though, however, he, he struggled to maintain um, a sort of emotional equilibrium as he became, as there were increasingly more demand for his new work and exhibitions. And one of the things he did in many ways was that he hid, oh, oh that's how I, I read the situation. He started working on houses and many of you would have seen these houses that he made, they're little houses or they could be rooms in which inside these rooms, he would do these little, um, uh, studio spaces which were constructed autobiographies of himself. What, I'm, what do I mean by that he was hiding? So on the one hand, these houses are large scale things, but on the inside of those, he was trying to present something about who he was. But because it was a very um, constructed space, it was both documents and aesthetics, it was, it was in many ways um, a fictional autobiographical um, staging of his of her, who he was. It was one of those things where I think he you no, know, he kind of started doing smaller scale works as well. It is actually interesting that it was during this period we actually see less paintings by him and more drawings. And it's really in the world of drawings that he seemed to be concentrated on. And drawings, as we as uh, in the last talk, was one of the most fundamental roots of how he of his practice. And this is again an installation from the LACMA show uh, when it will open again. Hopefully you guys will get to see this. It's a wonderful world of, of, of drawings and how important they are to him. One of the really interesting things about hiding in this world that he started to create for himself um, was that he was really trying to find a new way. He was trying to break through the constant writing about him that was really about the neo-pop super flat. And increasingly, as he becoming more famous, that was a framework that everyone used. And as a way of pushing away from that, he's tried to explore other things. Um, because he is a deeply private person, it was very hard for him to find a, 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 an element of who he was out to the real world. Um, he isn't someone who readily shares his secrets. And so it took a little while for, before he actually found his voice. And I think he finds his voice in music. 
what is really interesting in terms of why music is so important, not only was this at the very beginning of the start of his career, but he has a particular obsessive geek pursuit of it. It's part of that otaku spirit in that his interest in music is deeply personal. It's very participatory. There is, it's not really a performance of interest. There's a, a genuine love for these things. And what better way of understanding this than this visual mapping of music history? And this is actually one of the front covers of the catalogs that Chela was showing you at the beginning of the talk. It is at that level of intimacy of drawing that he is exploring in this particular period that he slowly develops an openness to, to sharing this side of who he is. I also just want to remind everyone once again that he, it was also during this period that he escapes to Afghanistan or not escaped to Afghanistan. He goes to Afghanistan, but I think for me, uh, I, I see that as part of his escape from the sort of noise that was going on in, while being in Japan with the demands of exhibitions. Now, one of the crucial th ways in which I think he makes a breakthrough in bringing his interest in music, his importance of drawing, his desire to try to break through that, that, that framework of everyone placing him within only in only within the world of manga and anime, and he wanted to share something about who he was, is when he starts in 2007 working in clay and in particular accepted an artist residence in the town of Sh uh, Shigaraki in the mountains outside of Kyoto. And what he does is now he brings in an other medium, ceramics, and we start seeing how he brings his drawings onto the surfaces of clay. And this is very important because by by working in another medium is how he starts expanding his space of exploring who he was as and, and making more public his persona and his interest in music. One of the things about drawing on ceramics that is very different from any kind of uh, the other kind of drawings he had done is that you cannot make any mistake with it. It's a marking that's permanent. And as a result of that, it has that ability to have to embody some of something of that sketchiness, that sort of graffiti like that kind of, of, of looseness that is so evident in his drawings as well. So there was something about the ceramics that fitted in what he was trying to achieve in drawings. And I kind of want to end this talk um, here and open it up for discussions by focusing on the middle image here. And it's a very, very simple uh, sketch. It's a scrap piece of paper and it's scrawled with the words, even if it is in love or affection, I have a single strong power that will never be defeated. And these are lyrics translated by Nara into English, something that he does quite a lot. Uh, and this is uh, uh, lyrics from a song called Linda Linda by the punk band, The Blue Hearts. It is a picture that we will see also, he's, used, he's done something very similar on the ceramics in 2009 as well. And we can see the, the, to get, the bringing together of these two different worlds. But what I'm really interested in is how this sketch really captures Nara. It is both very humble, but confident. It's quirky, but proud. And the message itself, this idea of I have a single strong power that will be never defeated, I think really captures so much of his journey from 2001 and 2011, a time when um, he had at the very beginning, at least, although he was being very successful, he was also being very much pigeonholed into the category that didn't really make sense in terms of his artwork. And he was trying to find ways of expressing who he was. Uh, but because he's a very private person, he was kind of struggling with this. And you can see that struggle throughout a lot of his work during this particular period. And it isn't until he finds through sketch, going back to that basic fundamental beginnings and, and where he all start, where he started in the world of art making, um, that this message really, I think, captures that struggle of that creative journey. And more importantly, in the words of music. Let me lend, um, I will end it here and perhaps open, uh, if anyone have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Iwan, for this incredibly insightful talk and 
all your work that you put into this and in, in your book. Um, I also want to answer a question that came in about where we can find the first uh, presentation in this series. And please keep a lookout on our um, LACMA's YouTube. Um, all of our three part series will be migrating to the YouTube channel. Um, so we'll, um, I'll, sh I'll present a few of the questions that came up. Um, one is, uh, did Nara ever draw uh, male figures besides his lonesome puppy? Um, so talk about some of the male figures that come up throughout his trajectory. Oh yeah, he did, and especially in his early works. And this is where, if you go back to the first, um, uh, the first session, you will see some of them. He did make uh, images of boys, uh, of young children, young female boys. Uh, sorry, young male boys, which are they're very charming, and a lot of those were connected to his early interest in illustrations uh, and Japanese illustrations. So he did do those. He's also done uh, portraits of of his teachers as well. Uh, so yes, there are, they're not that many, but there are some of them in his, in his uh, for sure. Great. Um, here's a question regarding, I don't mind if you forget me solo show, how mm -hmm. and when did he gain house, household reputation prior to that show particularly to the point where his fan base was formed and large enough to become brothers and sisters to um, comfortable with each other? Please Great question, me. and one that I couldn't, I one I couldn't fit into the talk. So I'm glad to whoever asked that. Thank you so much for that question. Um, he had always so during this period, you've got to understand between before um, that show, the Yokohama show, he lived in Germany, but he did a lot of shows in Japan, and it was really in 1995 that he became really established um, in in Japan. But he stayed connected to a lot of, and a lot of people um, started writing to him, and he stayed connected uh, through. Uh, internet. And if you think about it, you know, we didn't really have um, it, certainly in um, uh, internet access so readily until around 1995, really. And so he was really ahead of the curve by, by already engaging in this social media world um, as well. It was in 1998 that his uh, fan club was based and it was called Happy Hour. Uh, but he, Nara has always claimed that it was his fans that made him famous, not the galleries, because it was really through the consistent conversations with them and they're very intimate and they're very fun questions that he had and they were very open um, blog sites that he had that he was able to kind of engage with them and talk to them about his artworks and they were able to share what he liked about them. And so it was this very kind of community that was actually being driven, that was driving forward a lot of his, his engagement with his audience as well. And so the, the, that show, the 2001 show was so important because it really was a way for him to, to bring them into that space as well, into a very establishment space. And he, I didn't show this, I was looking at the houses um, that he did. He did a massive project in 2006 where he created, um, it was called A to Z Village and there were house A to Z and the whole project, which 26 and plus actually, there were some extra houses as well, there were about 30 houses, all of that was done by volunteers and it was self-funded as well. He wanted to work outside of the establishment system as well and, and Yokohama was one of the first way that showed him how he could do it. Great, and um, how do you think punk influenced Nara? Uh, uh, that, that's a really difficult question to uh, answer because I've asked, I've actually asked Nara that question a number of times and he's always like, well, I don't just listen to punk. I also listen to folk, I also listen to this and I always listen to that. He doesn't like to be pigeonholed in one particular genre of music, but it is at the core. It was, it was one of the earliest music that he really uh, connected to in particular Japanese punk bands as well. He's very close to that particular world and you really do see it. One of the, I, I, I didn't mention it but one of the images that I showed which is banging on the drums is actually a front cover of Bloodthirsty Butchers which is a Japanese punk band um, that he that he's very close and he's good very good friends with so he's really part of their world as well um, I for his 60th birthday party uh, he held a concert and in that concert he um, there were a lot of bands that came in. You can see just how closely connected he is with them and how much love there is between him and musicians as well. So he's very deeply connected and engaged with the contemporary music world and they remain a constant source. He, he's made about 30 odd um, album covers um, so far. So very important. 
Excellent. Um, I also have a question, curious about the relationship between pop art and super flat. Is there any? Um, by pop art, uh, we're, if we talk about pop art in terms of American pop art and super flat, there's definitely a connection in that Andy Warhol was very much part in the background of what Murakami is doing. But at the same time, it's very much also drawing on the pop, popular arts, pop art of what's happening in Japan or what's sometimes called Tokyo pop or Japan pop. And so all of those come together and it's very much part of super flat. And the key thing about that is, is that connection between uh, popular visual world and visual cultural world and the consumerist idea of that, the merchandise, the, the, the consumption of it. And those two things come together very importantly in um, super flat. So yes, it's very key to, to the super flat idea. Right, there's a few more questions. So um, do you think his artistic creations use copies of famous works um, are sim simultaneously out of respect and critique of the artistic masters? Um, I th it's definitely respect. Um, you can see that in a way that he he never truly erases the names of these images. And they're not, I should say, that there are copies and copies of prints, right? They're not the original works. He will never do this to original work. Um, but he has a lot of respect for his for history, art history. Uh, incredible respect for art history. So in that sense, it's that. I read part of it as not necessarily a critique of art history or these old masters, uh, but rather I think he engages with them in a way that questions how they've been written and presented. So he definitely engages with a dialogue with it, but I think the underlying thing is really respect. Um, again, just to give you an example, I once went uh, looking at art with him at the Whitney Museum and we, uh, he kind of zoomed through the whole thing. He was very fast looking at it. And at the end of it, he just gave me blow by blow of every single artwork he saw because he knew the collection so well. And that's the kind of artist he, he is, um, he's very, has a lot of respect for art and its, master, and its past histories. Excellent. And how do you think Nara was influenced by American culture and society? I know that's a huge one and covered in, a, in the first chapter as well, but uh, maybe some. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, when his first engagement, when he found um, with music was really through an American air-based radio show. Um, he didn't understand the words. I mean, he didn't know English at that moment in time, but he was deeply enchanted but, and carried away by the music he was listening to. And we're talking about, if it's a military-based um, music, we're really talking about a range of rock um, and country music. So he already was very much engaged with that particular world and he continues to be very excited by American music. He has a particular love for LA, I would say, as well. Well, um, part of it was because he liked the spirit of LA. I think it captures something of that. There's a lot of grassroots feelings to the art world in LA that he's particularly connected to. There's less of that sort of hierarchical structures that is such a big part of Japanese art world. Um, and that is again, also something that he really responds to well. And he kind of just, he's, yeah, he's very at home in LA. Um, so he he's definitely responds very much to that uh, as part of his, yeah, I would say, He's, he enjoys his time in LA. It doesn't quite answer your question, I know, but I think in, in the time that we have, perhaps that will be a way in of thinking about how much he is in touch with what's going on in America. Amazing. And uh, there was a question about if, if the exhibit will travel to Hong Kong anytime soon. Um, I'm not sure about Hong Kong, but I do know um, it is anticipated for the Youth Museum in Shanghai, China. So um, we hope um, it reaches there soon. Um, also, um, maybe to close it out, can you let us know uh, what we can expect in the uh, last session? And I am personally very glad that we cut this uh, program up into three parts because each chapter of his uh, trajectory is so rich and filled with, uh, with so much. Thank you for uh, these presentations. But yes, tell us what's, what's ahead. So the next uh, talk will be about his art from 2011 onwards. And in particular, it's a, it's a really important moment because it's about art after Fukushima. And Fukushima, um, the, the disaster that happened in 2011, in March 2011, was something that happened very close to his home. And it really led him to rethinking a lot about his legacies. Um, and we start seeing, uh, and I think 
one of the most interesting period in Nara's art making. I think what he is doing right now is him pushing even more boundaries than he had before. So if 2001 and 2011 was exploring, 2000 there afterwards, the next one is like, bang, he's there. He's found a, vo a new kind of voice and expressions. And that's what I'll be talking about next week. Beautiful. We look forward to welcoming everyone back. I um, so appreciate you, Iwan, and of course, Yoshitomo Nara for this important um, artistic trajectory of work. And we hope to see everyone very soon back at the museum. In the meantime, please uh, check out our catalogs, um, our additional uh, virtual public programs. There are many artists on the walls at LACMA, and we, we just can't wait to welcome you back. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone.